Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming to this presentation. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Catherine Hall. Uh, Catherine is Senior Lecturer in the Department of General Practice and Rural Health in the University, uh, but also point out that she is a classicist, uh, among other accomplishments, a classical scholar. And so uh, I'm sure we'll have some classical references sneaking in occasionally. But her topic tonight, fascinating one, is ergot, madness, and being female. Catherine. Thank you. Push this down to... Yes. Yeah. All right for sound. Is that okay for sound? Lovely. Oh, Tenakoto, 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 Katoa. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to everybody who is on Zoom. I'm not sure which way I meant to look for Zoom people, but I'll give you a wave anyway out there. Uh, I had one friend uh, text me just before to say that they would be watching. So I know there's at least one person out there. Um, and thank you too to, um, I know that at least one former patient has arrived to see me give this talk, which no pressure. <laughs> thank you, Jenny. <laughs> so um, before I start the talk, I'd like to first of all give a brief disclaimer. Um, the idea from about this talk was conceived about June last year. And Terry asked me to um, give a talk sometime this year about November or December, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and it came about because I was teaching about ergot poisoning in the third year medical selectives. And I decided that I wanted to do some more research. Um, and as I researched ergot, it became clear that there was a close relationship between this and madness and its use in obstetrics, which led me to wonder more about how could we relate all this together and does this have anything to do with our current ideas about postpartum psychosis. Now all this decision making was completely independent of the horrible and terrible tragedy in Timaru which occurred in September 2021 and more recently we've seen the sequelae in the court and so I just want to say I have no special knowledge of the case in Timaru um, and nothing, in, to the best of my knowledge, I'm going to say relates to that case in any way specifically, nor is it intended to make any comment on that situation. So after that sort of rather grim intro, um, let's move on to the talk. So the focus of this talk is ergot, um, and I'm just wondering how I get into the... Okay, into there. Okay, so we'll just move on to ergot. And here is a photograph of an ergotamine ampule kindly provided by my anesthetic technician husband. Um, so I don't have to pay for copyright to anybody else. Um, it's in use in obstetric wards around the world. You will find ampules just like this. Ergometrine is one derivative of ergot, and it's saved countless, probably hundreds of thousands of women from dying from postpartum hemorrhage over the years by acting on the uterus and causing intense constriction. Yet ergot's history is long, complicated, and shrouded in controversy. And in this talk, I will try to communicate some of this fascinating story. I will look at its history, both ancient and modern, I will try to illuminate its role, if any, about how madness and motherhood have been linked together and discuss whether these ghosts of time and history may still be influencing current medical decision making, or perhaps even being ignored at peril. So ergot is a tricksy drug. If there was any god of ergot, I would nominate Loki, the Norse god of ambiguity seen on my left. Uh, if there was uh, Loki was the god of being good and bad simultaneously, and sometimes assisting and sometimes being malicious. In many ways, his behavior summarizes the story of Urgot. And this slide I'm going to use a couple of times when we come to a part which sort of illustrates that type of behavior for the drug. So Urgot is a fungal infection of grasses, particularly rye grass, which is the picture that you see here but it can also uh, refer to infections of and infect barley and wheat grass. It forms a very hard 
black growth called the sclerotium, in plural sclerotia, on the grass head seen here. And it infects what's known as the ovaries of the grass head. I discovered that grasses do have ovaries, which is fascinating, and it affects them. But it manages to keep both itself and its host alive. So it's not a true parasitic, it's a symphysitic relationship. The proper botanical name for ergot is Claviceps purpura, Claviceps being the genus. Clavis refers to making a fist, which may refer to how when you, I talk about the contractions that ergot can induce in people, you get these tight tonic-clonic contractions. Uh, keps refers to the head, your cephalic presentations, those sorts of words, that's where it comes from. And purpura means red, which probably refers to the fact that any bread that's made with contaminated grain takes on a reddish color. Clavicaps purpura has a bitter taste, and this probably confers an evolutionary advantage to both itself and its host plant, as the bitterness dissuades insect and animal herbivores from eating the infected grain, thus allowing both the grain and clavicaps to happily propagate further. Early researchers who deliberately fed ergot-infested seeds to farm animals noted that after a few feedings, the livestock learnt to refuse to eat the diseased grain. The fungus is actually extremely ancient. The oldest specimen of the genus Cavicaps is a 100 million year old ancestor, Paleo Cavicaps parasiticus from the Cretaceous era, which has been found growing on a grass floret preserved in amber in, from Myanmar or Burma. It would have been eaten by herbaceous dinosaurs. It's that old. Havocaps purpura has probably been part of human life ever since about 8,000 years ago when humans ceased to be nomadic and settled down and began to cultivate and farm crops on a regular basis. An Assyrian tablet dated from 600 BC mentions noxious pustules on grain seeds and a body found in a peat bog in Denmark in 1952 called Man, uh, which dates from the 3rd century BC, was found to have ergot spores in his intestines, or the sclerotia. Um, occasionally, uh, outbreaks of ergot infection in stocks still break out in naive animals. There's no reflection on them, naive as in not previously exposed who are not familiar with it. And the last being in New Zealand in October, uh, sorry, in Otago in 2017. So the name ergot or ergo, as it originally was pronounced in French, came from France. It refers to the argo, the black backwards facing spur on roosters legs, rather like the dew claw of dogs. There are over 40 different words for ergot in the European languages, particularly from areas which grow a lot of rye. These are Russia, Germany, and France. And subsequently, they have greater exposure to ergot, and it tends to be more in their language. The first appearance of the word ergot in the English language was in 1682 in a publication. And I really do wish our, um, oops, sorry, it looks like it's, there we go, 1682. Um, I really do wish our journal titles were as beautiful as this one from 1682, which is Weekly Memorials for the Ingenious. I think I would sign up to that one straight away. Far, far more exciting than something that says New Zealand Medical Journal. Oh, I shouldn't say that really. Um, so this quote is from that journal. Um, a Monsieur Bernier who had practiced physique at Blois 20, for 28 years and in Paris for eight years, he had taken note of the malignant, malignity which sometimes spreads itself over all the rye of this country, i.e. France, and which breeding in the ears of corn, th that is actually a mistranslation, it was actually in the ears of rye in French, but it was translated in the weekly memorials into corn, certain black grains called in Salon Ergots. So um, Ergot's major medical actions, as I've mentioned, is what's called a uterotonic. It can cause a sustained contraction of the uterus. 
And it is also a very strong vasoconstrictor of the peripheral blood vessels. So it causes intense vasoconstriction of the arms and the legs. It's really a veritable pharmacopoeia in and of itself, as over a thousand compounds have been extracted or derived from clavicep species. Of the most relevance to this talk, however, are the ergot alkaloids, which can be isolated from this fungus. Now, over 40 of these are known. They're all derived from L-tryptophan, which in small doses makes you sleepy. It is L-tryptophan, which we find in milk, which gives us that nice sleepy feeling when we have a drink late at night. The most well-known ergot alkaloid is LSD. Now, many others of these alkaloids are equally hallucinogenic. And one odd characteristic of these hallucinations is that it often involves the sensation of flying. For example, in an episode of mass ergot poisoning in Pont Saint Esprit in France in 1951, the written record includes the story of one victim who, believing to himself to be an aeroplane whilst under the influence of the ergot poisoning, died by jumping from a second story window. Later, a theory arose, now disproven, that the CIA was involved in this poisoning. Um, and I found this delightful, uh, well, I don't know about delightful, but fascinating picture of the first frame of a movie that was made about this in France. Um, but uh, the CIA were not responsible this time. But there are many different reasons for paranoia. So separate from the therapeutic use of ergot, and this is where we start to see the Loki phenomenon again of good and bad at the same time, is this history of poisoning by ingestion of ergot, usually via infected bread. Poisoning by ergot is known as ergotism, which is not to be confused with egoism, which is a malady to which some medical practitioners appear to have de decreased resistance. Poisoning can be acute with sudden onset of large numbers of people experiencing er ergotism, such as in France, but also, and probably more commonly, whole populations would experience the chronic effects of ingesting small amounts of ergot on a daily basis. As rye bread was cheaper and regarded as the food of the poor, sustained ill health from chronic ergot injection, ingestion in the history of poorer communities, such as displaced Jewish communities and the diasporas in Europe, have been documented. And ergotism in either acute or chronic form could be fatal. Poisoning can cause two distinctive patterns. One is called convulsive and the other is gangrenous, although there can be some overlap of these syndromes. The convulsive type, um, and this is a picture of a, a young boy in the late 1800s um, suffering from ergotism, causes hallucinations and psychosis, as well as severe muscle seizures and spasms, tonic-clonic contractions, headache, nausea, and vomiting. The gangrenous form is associated with an intense constriction of the blood vessels of the hands, nose, feet, and legs, and can cause the limbs to actually drop off. Ergot certainly ex embodies the notion of being a pharmacon which is the ancient Greek word for medicine, which also means a poison, depending completely on the context. Its modern derivative, ergotamine uh, and ergometrine, is not free of troublesome side effects. Being such an effective constrictor of blood vessels, its use can be associated with inducing dangerously high blood pressure, and women have died from strokes and acute heart failure caused by this effect. But since the availability of syntocinon, which is an artificial analogue of the hormone oxytocin, this also contracts the uterus and reduces bleeding without the risk of these hypertensive crises. Ergometrine is now not the first drug of choice to be given if a hemorrhage does occur. However, as syntocinon is not effective and it is not as powerful a vasoconstrictor or uterotonic as ergotamine, ergometrine can still be used either alone or in combination with syntocinin. So it is still a, a drug of use in our current day. 
So having briefly introduced ergot and its actions, I would like to discuss now how ergot may have been used as a medicine in ancient Greek times, and if so, how these associations with hallucinations and the care of pregnant women may have expressed itself in the remaining extant literature from that time. As I mentioned, we know that ergot has existed for many eons and has been found in the archaeological record and Grabalaman's intestines, but was ergot actually recognized for its usefulness and toxicity at the time when Hippocratic medicine was being developed in the 5th and 4th centuries BC? Now, there's some difficult issues in, to address in answering this question. First of all, it's not just a simple matter of Googling the name ergot into a data bank of the Hippocratic text in order to ascertain this. The name, as you realize, of ergot is a much, much later invention. In addition, examining ancient Greek botany has some particular difficulties. Some plants we know have ceased to exist, even though they were very well known in ancient times. Other plants have evolved. Even if the name survives, how can we be sure if it really refers to the same plant? Plants can keep their name, but have quite substantial changes in their properties. And even though Clavicaps purpura may have remained stable and the evidence suggests it has, its hosts, the cereal grasses, may not have. So the starting point for my inquiry was first to investigate what cereals were in the diet of the ancient Greeks, for without exposure of consumption to the host of the host plant, it would be extremely like, unlikely there'd be any knowledge of this fungal infection or its medical properties or toxicity. So what did ancient Greeks eat? Barley and wheat formed their staple foods. Barley on the left, uh, the green photo, is often was eaten as a mash or a gruel or porridge, sometimes as a biscuit or a cake. And wheat was eaten as loaves, as, as well as gruel and porridge. Wheat was often in the form of particular breeds called emma or einkorn, and was really a luxury item. It was... Um, quite expensive. It did not grow well in most parts of Greece, grew best in warmer and less wet southern regions. And it was a more unreliable food source compared to barley, which was much more robust. Barley was known in Greece even earlier than wheat and was available almost everywhere in ancient Greece. Rye was virtually unknown except in the most northern reaches of Greece in Macedonia and Thrace. So there's Macedonia there, there's Athens down there, and Thrace is over there. Now, I will, you will hear me refer to Thrace several times during this talk, and Thrace has almost like a cultural trope for ancient Greeks. It was sort of the weird place over there somewhere where lots of weird stuff happens. They, know, they knew it existed, but they didn't really believe in it. And I was thinking it's probably a bit like how New Zealanders think of Australia and possibly vice versa. <laughs> we know it's there, but it, you know, is it really true? <laughs> so uh, Thrace is a, a place of mystery and, um, and almost myth, but not quite. Uh, neither Macedonians or Thracians were really regarded by certainly the Athenians and uh, the Greeks that lived in the south as being true Greeks. There was a bit of Greek, ancient Greek snobbery that went on there. Um, so Thrace really occupies where modern Bulgaria sits at the moment and some of Turkey and a bit of current Greece. It's more cold, uh, rye is more cold and drought resistant resistant, particularly compared to wheat. Um, barley is a bit more robust and somewhere in the middle. The dark bread that came from these regions, and they did know about rye-based bread, was despised by ancient Greeks in the southern regions. Um, but however, by the fifth century, Athens was particularly noted for its bread industry and extensively traded for foods and also new cooking methods, with the historian Thucydides noting because of the greatness of our city, all kinds of things are supplied to it from the whole world. So it is that we can take proprietor pleasure in enjoying other people's produce no less than our own. And that wonderful colonistic speech. So modest. As gourmands, they appear aware of, but derogatory towards rye-based food. But their ubiquitous and regular use of barley, and to a lesser extent wheat, 
does mean that they were exposed to the risk of ergot, especially after cool and wet growing seasons, as these climatic changes were and are very conducive to the growth of ergot. So what evidence is there that in specifically medical works, ergot is present in ancient Greece? So in examining the Hippocratic corpus of works, which is a collection of works, not necessarily written by all by Hippocrates, and almost certainly not, barley gruel was used extensively in the treatment of many disorders. For example, the treatise, uh, one of the books called Regimen in Acute Diseases, barley gruel called Pitasane, was considered especially nutritious and healing and almost a panacea for many, many dis disorders and diseases by physicians. And in another tract more relevant to this talk from the Hippocratic Corpus called The Diseases of Women, barley gruel is frequently employed as part of a therapeutic diet in the treatment of many diseases, such as alleviating the nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, helping with conception, stimulating breast milk production, purple fever, retained products of conception, and given generally to any woman after birth who is, quote, unquote, not doing well. In addition, it could be used as a uterine washout for retained products of conception, not just eaten, as well as an enema. So certainly any pregnant woman in ancient Greek would have been exposed to barley by various different means, and hence possibly ergot on multiple occasions during a pregnancy and delivery. However, potential unintentional intentional exposure is not the same as deliberate therapeutic use of ergot. What evidence is there that physicians actually used it to accelerate labor or stop postpartum hemorrhage? And here it gets quite difficult and the analysis has to be careful not to argue from silence, i.e. to state that just because something wasn't mentioned doesn't mean it didn't exist. And this is a very weak and poor form of historical reasoning. For example, ergot is missing from the list of therapeutics recommended to accelerate labor. But what does this absence mean? Does it mean it was not known or used or did they just simply fail to mention it? We don't know. So avoiding these types of discussions and concentrating on what is written and known about ergot, there are actually two entries in the diseases of women, which have been, which is part of the Hippocratic corpus, which have been translated as ergot in the Loeb uh, edition, which I was using, which is regarded as an extremely good translation. The first appears in book one, subsection 74.1, as a treatment to draw the menses or to stimulate menstruation. Ergot of wheat was mixed with water and applied as a suppository. The second entry, which occurs just a little later, is similar in that it is used to clean the uterus after a delivery and reads, grind ergot from wheat fine, mix with honey and apply as a suppository. You might think that's conclusive, but there are still issues. The Greek that is translated into the English word ergot reads as melathinin to ek perun, or more literally, blackness, melathinion, meaning uh, from the same root that we get melanocytes and melanoma, blackness, out of or from wheat. But wheat can be black for reasons other than ergot. It is vulnerable, as is barley, to sooty mold, which turns the whole ear black. And this is caused by other fungal species. So it may be less conclusive that this really is ergot than the translation suggests. Now, one strategy to try and establish the accuracy of one ancient source is to cross-reference to another. In terms of herbal and plant remedies, an invaluable source is Theophrastus's inquiry into plants. Theophrastus was a pupil of Aristotle, and on Aristotle's death, he inherited his library and collections. And he is regarded as the father of botany, having organized the first taxonomy of plants recorded in his book, Inquiry into Plants. Sadly, Theophrastus makes no direct mention in any book, any part of his book, of the phrase Melanthian to ek perun that I could find. He does, however, in book eight, write about how cereals, especially barley, are susceptible to rust. But the term doesn't 
encourage me to think that it's necessarily ergo, it could equally apply to uh, sooty mould. But there are two more references in Theophrastus which may mean ergo or ergot. The first is a reference to a plant called darnel. Theophrastus writes, now while it is not in the nature of any of these other seeds to, de to degenerate and change into something else, they say that wheat and barley can change into darnel and especially wheat, and that this occurs with heavy rains and especially in well-watered and rainy districts. Ergot thrives in moisture, and it may be possible that this transformation of barley and wheat and into darnel that Theophrastus records could be the emergence of ergot sclerotia on the head of the cereal, making the plant look quite different. And interestingly, very recently, and I'm talking within the last 15 years, modern day darnel has been found to have a number of hallucinogenic compounds, some of which are identical to what ergot has. So there is this possibility that these two things are mapping over each other. A final possible mention of ergot in Theophrastus's work occurs in book nine. In Thrace, and we're back in Thrace again, back in Australia, um, it's mentioned, it is said that there are fairly numerous other kinds of medicinal herbs, but about the most powerful is blood stancher, which stops and prevents the flow of blood. Some say if the vein is merely pricked, others if it is cut deeply into. Direct topical application of ergot has been used in the past in military medicine, even as recently as World War II, during which time children in Dunedin and all around New Zealand were asked to collect ergot sclerotia to send to England for the war effort. Apparently they all survived and don't tell Osh. Now, I'm hoping this link may, it may not happen. It does not look like it's linked properly. There is a link on YouTube, which actually is a wartime movie. So if you go to YouTube and put in New Zealand ergot, you'll find this, which shows the children gleefully going and collecting this incredibly poisonous substance for use back in England um, to help with uh, the military hospitals. Sadly, their efforts were in vain. Uh, by the time the ergot got back to uh, England, uh, it had rotted too much and its uh, coagulation effects were virtually nil. However, it's a, it, uh, it is a very interesting little wee video to have a look at. I will warn you, however, it doesn't spare its punctures and uh, it, it was a video designed to inspire people to go and collect this, and there, about a minute and a half in, maybe a bit less, there is a very graphic uh, filming of a young child being taken out of a bombed house, presumably in London or somewhere in England, who looks dead, and the mother running up and being held back by the policeman. So I do warn you, there are, it is actually a very sad video. However, interspersed with that, you see Jolly, and there's this very jolly militaristic music to carry you along. Jolly children in New Zealand doing their bit for the war effort. So some more confirmatory evidence about the ancient Greeks having any knowledge of ergot comes from uh, the work of another historian, Herodotus. Now, unfortunately, Herodotus wasn't really the most accurate of historians. I'm probably putting it kindly. He tended to be completely over-inclusive. Um, so, and so what we would consider as history in his book is liberally sprinkled with myth, theology, and legend. But in book four, he describes a race called the Hyperboreans. And this is a medieval map of where they thought Hyperborea might be. Um, it, it occupies basically where we would put at the Arctic. Um, Hyper means above, and Boreans relates to the Boreas, to Boreas, the god of the north wind. It indicates a reference to people who live far away to the north, either even further away than Thrace, um, and almost beyond the knowledge of, of the ancient Greeks. But something is actually known about them and recorded about them. On the island of Delos, which is to the far south of Hyperborea, it's about 190 kilometers to the southeast of Athens in the Aegean, 
The Delians told Herodotus that each year they received certain offerings packed in wheat and straw, transported hundreds of miles via Scythia, another northern region, along the Adriatic, um, down to Euboa, and then across the islands to Delos. Now, the first time this happened, the offerings were accompanied by two young women called Hyperoke and Laodiki. Herodotus describes that the two women came to Delos to bring to Olithia, who is the great goddess of childbirth and labor pains, the offering which they laid upon themselves in acknowledgement of their quick labors. So they brought the first one of these uh, offerings packed in wheat and straw. Now, obviously, there's some reference which links it to a type of cereal crop. Possibly it's to rye, um, as it's described as wheat and grasses, but not as wheat. And it's associated with the acceleration of labor, which is another effect of ergot if given in the second stage of labor. Um, but so tenuous though this may be, it does give some possibility that ergot was known and used in ancient Greek times. But before we move on to more modern times, I'd just like to make a few more, a few remarks about postpartum psychosis and how this was viewed in ancient Greek medicine. The relationship of pregnancy and madness is not as strong as one might think from the ideas that have permeated cultures subsequently about hysteria and the wandering womb. In diseases of women, causes of spontaneous miscarriage could include a psychological element, such as a woman who has had a fright that makes herself afraid or shouts or loses command over herself, quoting from book one. But the idea of a wandering womb that could travel around the abdomen was not, not given a psychiatric cause. It was not thought due to what we would call hysteria or neuroses. This overlay came culturally much, much later, but was actually purely physiological. In Hippocratic medicine, based on the four humors, the uterus was deemed a particularly moist organ, hence its need to menstruate. It would become over moist and would have to get rid of moisture to get back into proper balance. Women were considered generally moist and prone to over moistness, hence they cried frequently, for example. As described in Diseases of Women uh, in Book One, the cause for the uterus to move away from the pelvis was not a psychiatric disturbance. If the uterus dried out in any way, e.g., you didn't have your period, you don't have enough moisture, it would then seek to restore its natural moistness by migrating upwards in the abdomen to the next big organ which specialized in moistness, which was the liver. And then again, uh, for physiological reasons rather than psychiatric, you might see these symptoms. The patient turns the whites of her eyes up, becomes cold, some immediately turn livid. She might grind her teeth, salivate in her mouth, and take on the appearance of people suffering from Hercules disease, which was another name for epilepsy. If a woman's uterus stays against her liver and hypochondria for a longer time, she chokes to death. So this description is remarkably devoid of any overt psychiatric symptomatology or causation. It actually seems to me as a clinician more to be describing vasovagal compression with a pregnant uterus. Remember the, the non-moist uterus had stopped menstruating or perhaps a vasovagal faint associated um, as it can be with a tonic-clonic seizure. In fact, having read through the entirety of uh, diseases of women, there's actually very little in the book um, which lends itself to an interpretation of psychiatry itself or psychiatric disorders being specifically linked to being female. My sense is that this overlay was a product of a different time and place and culture. Probably, I suspect, for, um, reaching its epitome, uh, having read some articles um, and uh, books from the Victorian time, that this particular era is, is uh, rather culpable. Females were considered weaker than men in Hippocratic writings, but it was because they were more moist, not because of innate psychological inadequacy. You were innately psychologically or psychologically inadequate perhaps because you were over moist but not the other way around. 
In fact, there was a very long discussion in a later major work called Gynecology by Serranus, several hundred years later, in which he argues the pros and cons about really were there any real women's diseases as such, or simply conditions which occur because they happen to have a uterus. And Serranus completely dismissed any notion of the wandering womb. And until um, new works were produced in around the 1600s, Serranus's gynecology was the go-to textbook for, for doctors and obstetricians. I haven't searched through the entire Hippocratic corpus. That is actually quite a bit of work. But it is very difficult to find evidence of hysteria as we understand the term. I did find one direct um, reference which connects the idea of being female and being mad at the same time. It occurs in another Hippocratic corpus um, in a tract called aphorisms. Now, an aphorism is like a proverb or a rule or a medical moral, which can be applied to many cases. From book five, we have this one. When blood collects at the breasts of a woman, it indicates madness. The word for madness here comes from manine or mania. Uh, that's where we get our English word mania. So this is an agitated type of madness. One scholar has argued that this is referring to postpartum psychosis, but I'm not really convinced. Another possibility, in my opinion, and one which occurs with much more frequency, is blood in breast milk from untreated mastitis. With the woman being understandably extremely distressed, if not driven mad and agitated by the pain. Another aphorism does make a link between madness and convulsions, which you might see with ergot, but it's not specific to pregnancy. It states in meloconic affections, meloconic humor is likely to be determined in the following ways, apoplexy of the whole body, convulsions, madness, or blindness. So there is this connection of darkness, of blackness, with madness, with convulsions, but is it too much of a stretch to argue that this means they knew about ergot? It, is this just simply association and the febrile imaginations of a New Zealand classicist in the 21st century? I, I feel I can't say for sure. However, there is one final way of looking at cross-referencing if ergot might have been present, and that's to look at other forms of literature. So plays, poems, non-medical prose works, which might carry the shades or ghosts of ergot in its themes. One possible example is in Aristophanes' play called Peace, where there is a double entendre for the ancient Greek word for barley, krithē, is also used as the word for penis, giving some idea of linking barley with reproduction and fertility, an idea which might have underlay the, un, the very frequent use of barley gruel as a treatment for so many uh, obstetric and gynecological issues, which I described earlier. Also, there was that thought of ergot causing specific flying hallucinations. Could anything be made of that? Well, birds and flying have strong associations with the gods in ancient Greece. The word for birds is oionius, is the same as omens um, in ancient Greek. Birds were intermediaries. They traversed the world of the gods and came to the world of humans and back again. Some have particular associations, such as swans with lamentation, hence swan song. And also the brain of cranes apparently was associated with female libido. Do not ask me why, I could not find out why. One scholar has written that birds provided symbols, metaphors, and moral exemplars for human behavior. Going on to write, Esclesius gives us this terrible image of Clytemnestra after the murder of her husband, Agamemnon, in Esclesius's play, Agamemnon. Perched over his body like a hateful raven, she croaks her song of triumph. They really knew how to write well in those days. So if ergot did exist and was used in childbirth, this may have bled into society as cultural tropes or means of flying insane women. Do they exist? Well, several examples do come to mind. There is Medea, the estranged wife of Jason of the Argonauts fame, who on learning of his infidelity after 10 years of marriage, killed all their children and then flew off in a chariot drawn by serpents. 
and another are the harpies, the demonic winged females whose name meant snatcher. They were filthy, foul-smelling bird women with sinister, sinister voices and crooked feet. They persecuted Phineas, a blind king of Thrace, Thrace again, befouling and snatching away every meal that was laid before him. Eventually, the harpies were chased by the sons of Boreas, the previously mentioned North Wind. One of them fell into the Tigris River, and then the Tigris was then known as Harpus, derived from harpies. All goddesses could fly, and these included Demeter and her daughter Persephone or Kore, the goddesses of the grain. Demeter or Demeter was the goddess of the mature grain, filled with maternal potency, and Persephone was the goddess of the newly planted grain in autumn. Demeter was particularly associated with the Eleusinian Mysteries, a religious festival which involved drinking a barley-based drink or gruel called kaikion, as well as another festival called the Thesmophoria, which was a three-day women-only event, characterized by lewd sexual joking and banter, and the making of male and female genitals out of bread dough, either wheat or barley, before eating them with great gusto, washed down with the kakian. It sounds like a blast. However, how much does this actually reflect the use of ergot is, I'm afraid, still speculative. So that is really all I can say about the evidence for the presence of ergot in ancient Greece. The archeological evidence shows it did exist, at least in Northern Europe from that time. Some evidence links it to being known and used as a therapeutic agent in ancient Greek. Two grain crops, barley and wheat, um, could have been the vector for, of infection for Clavikeps purpura and were widespread in Greece. Several references exist which may well indicate that ergot was known and perhaps even used for medicinal purposes. The evidence is not conclusive, but it is certainly a plausible and a feasible possibility, which is often all we can conclude when analysing ancient history. I now would like to return to more modern times and conclude with a few remarks about how ergot is used and viewed currently. And to get there, I will very briefly canvas about 2000 years of history. So whilst it would be many centuries before, er before ergot would be recognized as the cause, we do know now that there were multiple epidemics of ergot, particularly in the Middle Ages. In the 10th and 11th centuries, ergot poisoning from rye infected with clavicaps was a common epidemic disease in France, for example. In AD 994, some 40,000 people died from ergot from an ergot outbreak in France, and many, many more died in recurrent outbreaks throughout the Middle Ages. Other countries such as Germany, Russia, and Eastern Europe, where rye was extensively used and bred, also had multiple outbreaks even into the 20th century. The gangrenous form of ergotism became known as St. Anthony's fire. Fire because it was extremely painful. It felt like one's limbs were actually being held in the flame. And St. Anthony, because that order of monks became associated with successfully caring for people with this disease, because they recognized some association with the symptoms and the ingestion of rye, even in medieval times, and banned the use of rye bread in their monasteries and hospitals. Ergot's uterotonic action in constricting the uterus was first formally documented in more modern times in the Renaissance era by Adam Lancia in 1582. European midwives were known to have given ergot to patients throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. A pharmacopoeia in 1660 mentions ergot being used for heavy periods and for menstrual regulation, such as delayed periods some causes of which would have been perhaps dysmenorrhea or amenorrhea, but undoubtedly some, in many cases, ergot was being used with effect, whether intended or not, to procure an abortion. In early 19th century, an American doctor, John Stearns of the state of New York, reintroduced the substance into medical practice from the midwives in 1807 in America. And on the other side of the Atlantic in 1828, Dr. Michelle in England, drawing on his own practical experience in Stearns's work, published a very enthusiastic paper on the use of ergot uh, for both accelerating labor once it's begun and also in controlling postpartum hemorrhage. I think that was in The Lancet. He stated that 
The result has been that after it's many, you know, got successful application for many years, I'm now fully convinced it is a safe and efficacious medicine in acutary cases, possessing all the properties which a practitioner could desire. I am of the opinion, therefore, that as soon as it is generally known in female practice, i.e. the midwives, it will supersede the necessity for male practitioners, except in a very few instances. Um, and then he, he includes a bit of medical politics of the time. That its benefits have not been more generally acknowledged may perhaps in a great measure be attributed to the prejudices of self-interest, which must clearly discern a falling off of fees, natural deliveries being charged less than forcep deliveries, which required a medical practitioner rather than a midwife, when ergot shall have been extensively introduced. So although some use of ergot did occur from this point into the 20th century, it, there has been controversy dogging it all along, really. Sometimes it could result in intrauterine death if given prior to delivery. However, its use in controlling postpartum hemorrhage increased after 1932 when Dr. Moore uncovered the writings of Stearns again and initiated a modern revival in obstetrics. And three years later, in 1935, the first intravenous preparation, ergometrine, uh, was invented virtually simultaneously and independently in four different laboratories in Europe and America. This preparation was a purified compound of one specific ergot alkaloid called ergometrine, and this is the medicine remaining in use today for severe postpartum hemorrhage. And in the 1950s and 60s, ergometrine was used almost routinely for every delivery in third stage until superseded by syntocinone. However, even at the height of its acceptability in, in the 50s and 60s, when it was re routinely used, it could still cause issues due to its ability to cause hypertension, stroke, and cardiac failure. One author wrote in 1959, in those persons who are sensitive, its use has produced nothing less than disaster. Whenever a new case is reported, it becomes a matter for astonishment that responsible manufacturers make it for medical use. With respect to postpartum psychosis, this was recognized as a possible complication of ergot, even in the early days of the, 18, of the 1800s, and by even the most enthusiastic of its proponents. A Dr. Bosch of Brussels recorded this history, for example. With her sixth pregnancy, she had a severe and prolonged labor and became agitated. After delivery, she had a postpartum hemorrhage. She was given some ergot and the uterus contracted. Suddenly, she was seized with de delirium, with agitation and incessant movements. The memory of a deceased relative came to her mind and she spoke as if this person were present. This lasted four to five minutes afterwards, she seemed to wake. After a pause, it all started again with the same manifestations, but was this time more violent and persistent. She had nine attacks over the next two hours. 11 hours after delivery, she had another final attack lasting 30 minutes. She slept for seven hours and remained well. She awoke with no memory of these events. So contrast this, sorry, um, this account of um, the last major ergot poisoning in Europe from Ponson Esprit was remarkably similar. This is what happened in 1951. That's a funeral procession of one of the victims being carried to the, the cemetery there. The first symptoms appeared after a latent period of six to 48 hours. In this first phase, the symptoms were generalized and consisted in a depressive state with anguish and slight agitation. Thereafter, a constant symptom appeared, insomnia lasting several days. An interesting feature of some cases was that the delirium was the first serious sign to be noted. It then appeared very late, between 10 to 12 days after the first onset of poisoning. Compare this to a very recent review of postpartum psychosis in, 19, in 2022. The term postpartum psychosis generally refers to a manic, mixed or major depressive episode with psychotic features, psychotic disorder not otherwise specified, and a brief psychotic disorder within four weeks postpartum. However, symptoms usually begin within the first two weeks after delivery, with approximately 65% of episodes occurring in the first three days. 
An oft-quoted description by Brockington, he quotes another paper from 96, highlights the overlapping of symptoms of mood disorders and postpartum psychosis. An odd affect, withdrawn, distracted by auditory hallucinations, incompetent, confused, catatonic, or alternatively elated, labile, rambling in speech, ag agitated or excessively active. At the turn of the 19th century, Jones described universality of sleep loss as an early symptom followed by anxious restlessness, a busy concern with trivial details, distrust, and an exacting irritability. Now, writing in 1989, the authors of Iffy, which is sort of highly appropriate when you're talking about a rather iffy drug, that really is his name, Iffy et al. These authors explored the rates of postpartum psychosis and noted uh, in the last half of the 20th century, and noted that this condition had been encountered with relative frequency 30 to 40 years ago, but only rarely in recent years. They ascribed this change occurring when ergometrine was largely replaced by syntocinin, writing, we attribute importance to this trend, noting the apparent scarcity of cases of purpural psychosis in recent decades. Now, as I said, ergometrine is actually still in use occasionally. Despite this historical record, and for reasons I have not been able to ascertain, there is actually currently no mention in the New Zealand formulary, formulary of any psychiatric symptoms associated with ergometrine, let alone postpartum psychosis um, for either ergometrine or its combined form with syntocinin called syntometrine. And neither do the MedSafe data sheets for ergometrine and syntometrine mention any psychiatric symptoms under their special warnings and precautions for use, although both data sheets do warn of the vasoconstrictive and hypertensive effects. The only reference to any possible psychiatric effects only occurs under the heading undesirable effects for ergometrine, where dizziness, hallucinations, and vertigo may occur, but none are noted for syntometry. Now, I might be mistaken, and I may have to refer to uh, do some more research on this, but as far as I can tell, the current preparation of ergometry is identical from what was used from the mid-1930s onwards. Therefore, if I am correct in this, history would urge current physicians, obstetricians, and psychiatrists to pay careful heed to whether or not this drug was used during the delivery of a baby even if symptoms start days, even a couple of weeks later. Even if I'm not correct for some reason, it, this is a salutary reminder to always be vigilant and look for organic or bodily or medication causes for psychiatric symptoms in obstetric patients and not as, ascribe them to hormonal or social causes automatically. The 2022 review, which I alluded to previously, did not actually mention therapeutic drugs at all as possible causes for postpartum psychosis. Yet not only is ergometrine a possibility, but also bromocryptine, which is derived from similar compounds to ergot as well, and has been used to stop lactation and can cause similar hallucinatory illnesses. I would describe ergot as an example of where the study of medical history although regarded by some as perhaps a quaint hobby, can actually be practically useful in reminding us of good patient care and basic medical principles, even in the current day. And to paraphrase Winston Churchill, I would say it is better to know one's professional history before dooming yourself, and more importantly, dooming your patients. So thank you very much for listening and I'd be very pleased to receive any questions. Thank you. Okay, questions. I'll bring the microphone around to anyone. Can I start off? In referring to postpartum psychosis, you're distinguishing that from postpartum depression, or is that in some way included in that, in your comments? 
Um, it's inclusive. So it, postpartum psychosis would refer to either an agitated or a depressive psychosis. And ergot can be associated with both, but tends to be more associated with, with mania, with an agitated psychosis. Right. Other questions? Yes, Thanks. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm really intrigued with who looked after these people, whether special nurses, carers, families helped to look after them, because my interest is in caregiving, um, or was it institutionalized, or what happened? Well, it depends on the era. In medieval times, the only care would be either your family or maybe the wise woman of the village. And if... <laughs> and if you were really lucky, you might be close to a St. Anthony's monastery or hospital. And um, But what tended to happen was that people went to the St. Anthony's hospitals, were treated, and then returned to their homes and couldn't afford anything other than rye-based bread and fell back into the same symptomatology. And so one of those slides where I showed the uh, uh, on the right-hand side, there were people in the village scene with amputated limbs. This is from the vasoconstrictive effect and the gangrene that occurred. So people would lose whole limbs. Uh, apart from the St. Anthony's hospitals and monasteries, I'm not aware of any specialised caring for them. Um, the European plagues, uh, epidemics of ergo poisoning were incredibly horrific. Um, not only did thousands die, but for every one who died, there were many, many people who were severely affected. The other piece of anatomy that could drop off was your nose. So you would have these people with just a a large hole for their, where their nose used to be. Um, I'm really interested to hear about these caring communities, but I haven't in all my reading found any other than St. Anthony specific for ergot poisoning. There may have been some in Russia. I wonder whether in the East that tended to be, they tended to have more severe plagues of, of ergot as well. Um, and I haven't really gone into the history of Russia or Eastern Europe. Uh, probably because you know my, I don't speak Russian at all, and it may be quite quite hard to get hold of translations. But there may be some data from there. I um, just can't recall any other apart from Saint Anthony. Yeah. yeah. Wait, 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 wait. You've got to wait for the technology. The mi microphone has to be with you. If it wasn't too severe, is it possible that once they were removed from that infected bread or wheat, that they would gradually recover? Absolutely, yes. You could, it, you could, as long as you hadn't been affected for too much for too long, you could make a full recovery. That was quite clearly documented from the St. Anthony monasteries. Unfortunately, as I said, they tended to just return to their impoverished villages and have to resort to rye bread again, even though they may have been told by the monks to avoid it, and they just didn't have any choice. Pa past a certain point, though, you, you know, your illness would become inevitably fatal. Um, Catherine, this is something a bit different, but you mentioned how animals, um, when they consumed rye, well, we bred Canadian elk deer up in central Otago, when we were farming, and um, a Canadian elk stag ate ryegrass and got the staggers, and it promptly took itself off to a pond. <laughs> My poor husband had to try and get him out before he got down, and then he would absolutely die, but it would probably be the same sort of thing, would it? Oh, it could well be, and it may be that you know, with the intense vas vasoconstriction, the stag had a perception that it was very hot and wanted to lie in something yeah. cold. You know, so two days a day late. Because normally they would know. never go. I mean, it's, it's hard to know. It doesn't really make much physiological sense saying that out loud, but you wonder if there was yeah. some but it, the, regulation. The staggers, and, you know, mm. they could die from it. 
So um, I never sort of thought it was anything like you've mentioned. Yeah, it could well be. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's, the last one, as I said, was in 2017. Um, I haven't been able to find any other mentions since 2017 in New Zealand, but it happens fairly regularly. Mm. Um, and I understand that if you do go up onto Flagstaff and have a good look around, you can probably find some ergot. But I probably wasn't really meant to say <laughs> that, was I? <laughs> no, well, thank you. It was very, very interesting your talk. Thank you. Another question? Anything on the uh, chat? No. Is there anyone on? I don't know. Can you see? Uh, just a comment from Zoom. Perhaps the latter stages of this presentation could be presented to the psychiatrists who chart, who care for postpartum psychosis. Uh, and then just a, a few. That was excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Comments. Thank you. Thank you. No other comments? Well, I'd like everyone to join with me and thank Catherine for a wonderful, very informative presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And if anyone wants to come and chat, that's absolutely fine. <laughs>